Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Beyond the Bay Live. This is a feature film discussion on the movie The Manchurian Candidate. Uh, it's a what we have here is a Q&A discussion on the film itself. And what we do is the Beyond the Bay series runs classic films and we do a Q&A uh, live session uh, after the film is aired at the Bay Theater or just from streaming. Uh, this program is brought to you by the Bay Community Theater. We're a nonprofit organization running the Bay Theater in Sutton Bay, Michigan. And tonight again, we're going to be having a venturing candidate uh, for the discussion. Uh, our guest panelists, we have three guest panelists today, uh, one special guest, guest panelist. Uh, and let's get started and let's introduce these panelists here. Uh, the first one to introduce is Ted Kroll. Ted is a film historian, uh, which he taught film classes at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut, and helped to establish a movie theater that is still operating today. Currently, Ted is a Leelanau County resident and a member of the programming team at the Bay Community Theater. Next we have is Kevin Maher. Kevin is a industry professional, and he's worked for over 20 years at several studios, including Warner Brothers, 20th Century Fox, and Disney. Kevin is a member of the programming team at the Bay Community Theater and writes, maintains the film blog, top10filmsless.com. And as a special guest tonight, as a special guest tonight, we have David Amran, Amram, excuse me. And David is the composer of the music for the Manchurian Candidate. We're really glad to have him here tonight. David has been described as the Renaissance man of American music. He has composed over 100 orchestral and chamber works, written two operas, and many scores for theater and films. He has collaborated, collaborated with such notables as Leonard Bernstein, Dizzy Gillespie, Dustin Hoffman, Charlie Mingus, Alia Kazan, Odetta, Jack Kerouac, Betty Carter, and Tito Puente. He has conducted and performed as a solos with symphony orchestras around the world. Since being appointed first composer in residence with the New York Film Ironic in 1966, he has become one of the most acclaimed composers of his generation and is listed by BMI as one of their 20 most performed composers of concert music in the United States. Well, thank you very much for being here today. We really do appreciate you taking the time to come out and be here with us today. So thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so how this is gonna work folks, is that we're gonna be basically uh, uh, on the screen here. And what you do is we want you to answer, que uh, post questions so that we can answer them. And how you do that is go to your comment section that's on the side of your screen, and it's gonna either be on the side or it's gonna be along the bottom. And we'd like you to go in there and place a question in there. And we have uh, somebody standing backstage, our white fan standing backstage, who is going to uh, post questions when we ask for them to come up. So that's how this all works. And we hope to get through all the questions today. And if not, well, there, we always remember those questions and we can always come back another time, all right? All right, well, thank you very much. So, but to get everything started, what I'd like to do is to ask every, uh, every um, guest panelist a question uh, to kind of get us rolling and let more people join us as we're, we're talking here. Uh, first, we'll start with Ted. And the question we're gonna ask each one of them is, why is this film significant enough and significant enough to remain a part of film history? Ted? Hi, hi everybody. Um, this is a film that was made in 1962. And when it first came out, um, it, it was fairly popular, but you have to understand it was also released right in the middle of the, Cu the, missile Cu the Cuban Missile Crisis. So, um, people had other things on their minds, and then a year later, the Kennedy assassination, um, you know, kind of caused uh, people to think twice about this movie because of the assassination in that. And so it kind of faded out of uh, circulation for, I don't know, 15, almost 15 years or so. And then it was re-released in 1988 to great acclaim. And I guess sort of what happened was that society caught up with the movie. Um, the, the movie itself is, is just a, a bunch of a, a, a salad of different genres. There's a little war movie. There's a little romance. There's a little, um, a, a lot of satire. And um, then there's this thriller, which includes the assassination, of course. 
And so um, that kind of, and, and well, and for me, and what I discovered working on it this time, underneath it all is a, um, a tragic story of um, Raymond Shaw, who has his soul swiped from under, from, taken away from him. And um, he, at the end, he, he, um, and he ends up killing himself. So it, it's this whole mixture of things. And I, I think it took a while for um, people to realize what a, uh, what an amazing mix is. And, and, and there's some very surrealistic scenes in it. So I think people first saw it that we were a little, might have been confused about what was going on. But uh, society caught up, the films caught up with society or the other way around. And um, as we watch it now, we see the amazing performances. I mean, most people think of Angela Lansbury playing the uh, evil mother, but there's also Frank Sinatra playing um, a, a real character rather than uh, himself in a movie like a lot of actors do. And then, um, the, of course, the, the, the main character, Lawrence Harvey, is it's just an extraordinary uh, performance there. And then you have all these other people, you know, like David composing the score, um, great photography, amazing editing. So it, uh, not only is it a, the film itself with all the interesting things in it, it's also incredibly well made. And the pace of the film just it never gives you a chance to kind of sit back. So that's what I've got. I know I went on for a while, but there you <laughs> go. That's okay, Ted. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So Kat, it's Kevin, uh, why do you think this film is significant to remain in film history? Can't hear you, Kevin, you're muted. Beginner's luck. Um, I think any film to judge its greatness it has to stand the test of time. And, and Ted mentioned that uh, this film was essentially shelved uh, for a couple different reasons for you know upwards of 20 plus years. Um, and, and I think when it was really re-released, when, when Ted noted, it, it, it did um, take its place as one of the, the best political thrillers. Um, I, I mean, the title itself has become part of the lexicon, right, of uh, a, a Manchurian candidate is a, a known entity in the political world. Um, but I think uh, Ted nails it. I, I think where it, it, the whole thing is its sense of immediacy, and it's still very uh, prophetic today, um, but in, at its core, it is a personal tragedy. It's a very, it takes on very large concepts, but really at its core, it's a very personal tragedy. And, and I think that's what elevates it to, to greatness. Very good. So David, why do you think this film will stay as part of uh, film history? Need a uh, mute, David. We need you to go off a of mute. Oh. Still on mute. Mute. Okay. There it you was go. A, it was a great book. It was a great story, and because of the strength of Frank Sinatra's position and Angela Lansbury's brother, who was a co-producer, and the other people, rather than having fifteen ghostwriters come in and destroy the script to homogenize it. It was done with the idea of telling that story. And the director, John Frankenheimer, was extraordinary. He said to me, David, I only have two things to tell you. It's not a Chinese war movie. And the film will tell you what to do. In other words, he let me alone to do the very best that I could do. Angela Lansbury was only two or three years older than Lars Harvey in real life. But John said to me, I'm great at filming, but with 95% of this is casting, I show the actors where they're supposed to be, what the scene is about, and then I let them do the best that they can. So all of us, all the amazing photographers, the musicians, the lighting people, the recording people, the extras, everybody did their very best. Everyone was allowed to do their best. And as a result of a collective effort with a bunch of gifted people and a wonderful story, we did something that's considered to be like Citizen Kane all these years later, and something as the great 
poet John Keats said, a thing of beauty is a joy forever. It didn't get destroyed in the process of being made. And that's a very rare experience in anything. It was a true group collaborative effort and just an honor to be part of. Thank you, David. Thank you for that. And that, I think we're all having that same feeling how great this movie is. We really appreciate that. All right, now it's time to get into the questions. Uh, White Fang, do we have a question from the audience? How was this movie received when it came out? Ted, do you want to start with that? Well, I, I, I talked a little about that earlier. Um, I, I think, um, well, it came out at the wrong time. Like I say, it was released uh, in, 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 a, in, the, in October of 70, 62, which was when the uh, Missile Cuban crisis was going on. And then um, I, I guess it did okay, but it, it wasn't seen as um, the spectacular, interesting film that we, we how we evaluate it now. So um, all, all I can say is it, it, at first it, it, it did okay. It was seen as a Frank Sinatra movie, I think, and um, a thriller. And it had it was you know seen as kind of an oddball film too because of all the different parts that uh, were coming together. And, and I don't know if it actually, people were quite ready for it. I guess Psycho came out a couple of years earlier. So people were used to Hollywood films not being so, um, so um, you know, happy endings or that, you know, you would go through a whole movie where all this awful stuff happened and then in the rabbit we pull out of the hat at the end. Uh, so this was another movie, um, a trend that was going on. And I don't know if it quite caught on yet. And also the style um, was, was, uh, wasn't studio style. There was some studio work in it and there's some amazing camera work in it, but a lot of it was filmed on, on site and that was something new too. So that, that's my part of it. David or Kevin, any further comments on how the movie was received? You hear me now okay? Mm -hmm. Oh, now we lost you again. Oh, okay, pardon me. Uh, I remember they had a preview in San Francisco and we were put up in this wonderful place and the wife of Mr. Axelrod said, oh my goodness, he said, they're having a, almost like a riot and a protest because all these people are carrying signs that think we're a bunch of communist pinko troublemakers trying to overthrow the government. <laughs> and he said, actually, before they expressed that hostility, they should see the film and realize that, that actually in the film, the woman who was responsible for this and having her son all messed up was a communist, was working for the Russian government. So uh, the reason I mention that is that there was so much craziness and paranoia at the time that a lot of people assumed before even seeing it, what it was. And of course, the beautiful thing is that over a period of time, we see the satire and the crazy plot. And as was, as was mentioned, the amazing camera work. That was John Frankenheimer's brilliant visual sense and his chance to let everyone do their very best. And now all these years later, it seems relevant, but ultimately it was a really great story and it was done well and a good object lesson for anybody, not just making a film, but if you're building your own house, having a garden, driving a bus, writing a symphony, whatever you do, to try to do a good job and not look for shortcuts, but to do a good job. And if you're working with other people, to inspire them to do their very best. Very good, David. Thank you. Kevin, anything further on this topic? No, I, I just add on to what uh, David said about uh, Frankenheimer's work on this film and and the the impact that he had. I mean, recently coming from you know his vast experience in live television, and I always go back to two specific shots. Uh, the, the one shot is obviously the 360 degree view of the garden party slash uh, uh, meeting of the the communist brain trust, um, but then I. I that and then the other scene when um, the uh, Eislin is is trying to disrupt the Senate hearing, and Frankenheimer puts Angela Lansbury in the foreground, a television in midground, 
and then he has this, the senator railing away in the background and this three dimensionality that yes, that's the shot right there. That's brilliant. And you didn't see a lot of three dimensionality like that in films um, at that time because it does give it a live documentary feel. And I think that's Frankenheimer, uh, you know, bringing his experience into, uh, into the filming and, and elevating it um, as well. Mm -hmm. And I, I think actually also, I want to compliment on that too, is that the scene here, I like the scene because when you look at it, where this is 60 some years later, and we think about all the technology we have today and how we use it, we can capture things from phones and, we don't need big cameras like this, but that was a, we had the presidential debates, you know, and that was a big thing back in those time period, the use of televisions like this and how it was all pioneering to what we have today and the type of uh, attitude we have. But the camera angle, like you said, is being able to, like you said, three dimensional, have this put all together like this was just amazing. So. Step in here. Yep. Um, Frankenheimer, um, there's a version of the movie where you could hear him talk about it as the movie's going on. And he was in for that television business. He was in the television booth. He was directing the television shots. And the other scene that was going on behind him was, was kind of going on on its own. And he said that the, the main actors that were talking were improvising, the shouting back and forth. And what he was, con only thing he was controlling was the, 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 uh, the, the TV cameras as it was going on. So, it was the TV going on at the same time that the, the bigger thing was being shot, which is kind of interesting. And, and, and speaking of the 360 degree shot, he also talked about, it starts on the garden party with the lady with the, you know, the Southern lady with the, the gloves and all that. And it goes around and you see the garden party people. And then when it comes all the way back, it's the communist um, brainwasher guy. Well, apparently they had two sets on tracks so it started on one track uh, with that one scene with the garden party. And as the camera moved away from her, they shifted it to the, the Chinese people and, and all the soldiers, yeah, all the soldiers ran into the new seats, um, into the different seats by the time the camera came around. So it wasn't done with any tricks. Well, it was sort of a trick, but it wasn't done through any camera work. It was just uh, just really well it's, it's, it's seamless, really, and it's, it's pretty amazing the way it was done. I hope I explained that correctly. But. Yeah. Hey, Larry, I want to go off script for just a second, because I would like to hear if, um, if David, if you were able to spend any time on the set while they were shooting, or was your work done separate from the, the shooting itself? No, I saw quite a bit of it, but that particular scene, I was told there's a really weird scene coming on and we need your help. So I was sitting at the Montecito Hotel about 14 hours a day on a little upright piano grinding away and using what they called a moviola where you cranked a little <laughs> film that was sent and saw how long or how short it was. So I got this thing delivered. I put it in and I saw that scene of the people that looked like my great grandmother who lived in Savannah, Georgia at a tea party. And then suddenly I said, man, they must have sent me the wrong stuff. So John <laughs> called me up and he said, David, how did you like that scene? And I said, man, was that what it was supposed to be? And he said, definitely. He said, how did it make you feel? I said, I thought I was going nuts. He said, that's the idea. I want the audience to see and feel that they're part of being there and on psychotropic drugs being brainwashed Oh, I said. Then he said, we need some music to help that. So I thought of using a harpsichord, which I'd only done for Shakespeare in the Park, three piccolos, and try to find every wrong note that was sickening that I could use, <laughs> sort of like Arnold Schoenberg's outtakes with them. and a Viennese waltz that played at a tea party at the same time and came up with what I thought was truly hideous, stomach-turning, and scary. And people said, that was amazing. I said, that was easy to write. I spent my whole life looking for what I felt were meaningful write notes. This time, I just chose, chose everything that seemed wrong. The, the main title, the beautiful 
theme that I wrote, which expressed Lawrence Harvey's tragic end to a, a per great character who was doomed, rather than that, which took me a week to write, I was able to do that because all I did was try to find everything that was wrong. And that somehow seemed to help to fit in the scene. Some of the other ones that I did see when Kai D, who was a great actor, was an old friend of mine, was in one of his scenes and some of the others I came to see and I met the actors who were just amazing. But essentially, my job was just to, to do what I was sent to do, which was getting things out of order, in and out, then looking at the script to see where I thought they would be and praying that what I did would be helpful to the film because film scoring is an art. That's why I didn't spend my life in Hollywood and because to me, anything you do in music, whether I played at Attica Prison or Carnegie Hall conducting, which I've done both, or when I came to your wonderful community and had my cello concerto played in the sand dunes, everything is big time. Everything is an art and every, you're supposed to do everything well. And I realized this was a chance to work on a great film, but I just didn't want to stay there and have to do any old junk. And I also didn't use a ghostwriter or an orchestrator, because I tried to do the very, very best I could, like William Walton, Leonard Bernstein, wonderful John Carigliano, who occasionally, and Aaron Copeland, occasionally did film scores, but they were composers who occasionally worked in the films. They were not film composers. Very good. Yeah, the music you, you did select, I mean, it has enough dissonance but yes, melody to it. And I just thought it was, I mean, you say you're, you're, you're struggling over the right notes to pick, but I think it wasn't so much the right notes you picked. I think what you did a good job is understanding the tension and the feelings of the actors or what the characters were feeling or what was going to go happen in the, the event itself. Well, it's like when you write an opera, you try to do something that supports the drama and supports the singers and tells a story in itself and is musical. And if you show how brilliant you are by drowning out the singer, drowning out the soloist, drowning out the words, or when I played with Jack Kerouac, drowning out his poetry, or when I played with Dizzy Gillespie or Willie Nelson, playing a lot of hot licks on the flight of the bumblebee and the bombing of Hiroshima, when you're supposed to be part of the whole, the idea in music and in life is to be what they call in Afro-Cuban music, in cajunto to be together, to be part of the whole, to make a contribution. It ain't that hard, but that's so different from the way we're trained. Oh. It takes a lifetime to get to that point. The other thing about a lot of film music is while you're watching the film, oftentimes you don't hear the music. It's present and it has any, uh, it, it, you know what I'm saying? It doesn't stick oh, sure. out at you and it sets the mood, but um, people don't pay attention to the music so much as much as the emotional import uh, that it gives to the film, you know? Well, that's why I was told, that's why it took so many decades for my scores to finally come out because I was told the mantra over and over again, it don't sound like movie music. <laughs> I, said, I wasn't writing movie music, I was writing music for a film. Yes, that, uh, we applaud you for that very much. This Thank is still, you. I, you know what I, because this was so many years ago, I saw it the first time, and that what walked away from me was not just the film itself, but the music, and it, I thought it was just excellent. So, well, that's true. A film like The Godfather, I mean, that was incredible music, and it enhanced the film. And there's many, many composers like Alex North and so many others who've written gorgeous music, which helped the film and was good music, and that's hopefully. We'll see more of that. And with young people today having the doors open with independent films and places like your independent theater, there's no reason why everything shouldn't be on a high artistic level. And I think that's gonna happen. And small is beautiful. And sometimes going back to the nitty gritty is a big help for everybody. I remember once um, Leonard Bernstein on the uh, Young People's Program he plays some music that sounded like, you know, Arnold Schoenberg, Arben Berg, and all that kind of stuff, you know, really, um, you know, dissonant kind of thing. And he said, well, this is from a, 
a science fiction movie about a spider that goes <laughs> underneath the spiders and all that. So sometimes, mm-hmm. I guess some of these composers had some ch- had a chance to do some of their um, tr- do their chops out there uh, when they least expected, you know. <clears throat> well, I think the most tragic part is that it was assumed you would have an orchestrator and assumed you would have a ghostwriter. And when I said, no, I write my own music, I orchestrate it, I choose the musicians, I conduct it, I try to play it, I tried to do, and then I used the fatal words, a good job, because I was brought up on a farm where that's all you're trained, do a good job and do better than is expected. And that idea that anybody would be concerned with that, I realized was an anathema. So I figured perhaps I'd be better off going to my $85 a month apartment in the village. I wasn't married then and just continued cranking it out and trying to do what I'm doing to this very day. And I thank heavens I follow those career death wishes and I encourage every young person, whatever they do in life, to do the same, to do your very best and find, if you feel you were put here to do something, do it and do your very best and don't wait and be told you're going to do that later. Because when I was told up by my lawyer, I said, man, there is no later. (laughs) <laughs> all right well thank you we should move on to another question we got a question from the audience in here hey good to see you uh, when you score a film do you read the screenplay or just see the film and score it after it's shot that was a question we've talked a little bit about it but that's from oh. the audience well i'll try to give a short answer because we have some distinguished people here and i don't want to go on too long but oh. i always ask to read the script i don't need really to shock anybody first of all to see if it's something I'd like to be involved in. If it's really disgusting, that's people's constitutional right, but there's already enough tsunami of swill on two or three generations to not have me contribute to that. I'm not snobbish, but I do have some kind of standards of something. So if it looks like it's really just disgusting to me, I'd say, well, I don't think I'm really qualified to do that but I like to read the script first just to get an idea of what it is and then try to imagine what it might be like. And then to try to see the film being made, I did that with Splendor in the Grass, I was even in it, and try to get a sense of being part of something because that's what we all are supposed to do in any collaborative effort. If you're cooking a meal with someone else, you don't barge in and throw them out of the kitchen you see how you can contribute a little something to that nutritious stew. Very good. Now you're making me hungry. (laughs) There's this thing called a click track, right? Where you you synchronize it with the film. When you were conducting the film, conducting the music, were you, did this was the screen out up in front of you and you had to squeeze it into an exact right? Or is, is that, is that how it worked? Well, I practiced it at home, so I just had a beginning and an end. And from playing jazz and playing with folk musicians all my life, I have some sense of rhythm. So I had it timed out so that when I was doing it, I was able to start and stop at the same time. And certain parts of it, when they were singing the Star Spangled Banner, and we had to get it out of tune in the right place. I got all the trumpet players and the bridge to pull their slides out so they could be out of tune with the singer, which they did live. And I used the click track for the one March scene so that it would coordinate with the film. But other than that, I didn't use that. And very often they use click tracks because the people who are conducting it know how to pick up the baton, but that's about it. So therefore, the musicians all put in earphones, don't pay any attention, and crank through it. But the click tracks are are certainly useful for certain things. But when you're doing music, unless it's, you know, rock around the clock or something, (laughs) you try to uh, do it so that it sounds and feels like you're telling us. So it feels and sounds like real music. Very good. All right. uh, White Fang, do we have another question? Eleanor Eisling kisses her son passionately after explaining how she will get vengeance for her son's soul being stolen. Is this the creepiest mother scene ever? (laughs) Kevin, I see you smiling. How'd you start this one out? 
Well, perhaps. Um, but I, I, if you notice that scene, um, she's holding his, she's cradling his face in her hands. And Frankenheimer said that, make sure that as you do that, um, and she goes in for the kiss, you really don't see their lips lock because her hand is blocking that. Um, and he, in, in an interview that I had read with Frankenheimer, he said that was very deliberate because the more that you don't see, sort of the worst it, the worse it is because it's clear what's happen, happening. Um, but I, I think it is pretty creepy. I think her characterization, uh, Lansbury's that is, in its totality is one of the um, most um, despised and most evil uh, portrayals um, in, in in American film. I mean, for every character that she interacts with, she manipulates them and and sort of pushes them down. Um, sort of, she's soul crushing. So as his son's being his son soul being stolen in that moment, um, it had been stolen years before um, when she uh, broke he and Jocelyn up the first time. Mm-hmm. Oh, very good. Well, thank you very much, Kevin. Anybody else want to add to that? Yeah, if you ever read the book, um, the, the Eleanor Isolin, whatever her name is, um, there, there's a there's incest that happened to her, and that this, that scene doesn't just stop with the sloppy kiss with the hand in front of it. Oh. Oh. That. <laughs> There's a lot in the movie, a lot in the book that it's just kind of really um, over the top, and that's that's part of it too. <clears throat> Any other comments? Okay, another question came up from Rick Andrews. David and Ted, share your mutual friend story. So nice, you guys connected. Right. Uh, you want to start, David? Well, I had met Ken Pasmanic, great bassoon player, for whom I wrote bassoon concerto years later when I was a teenager living in Washington, D.C. And we became friends and he encouraged me to do just what I was doing. I was writing music for theater productions at Howard University because the drama professor lived next door and Ken came and played the bassoon. When Charlie Parker came down to my basement apartment to hear our little jazz group with Ken, myself, and a wonderful flute player, all of whom played classical music from Europe and jazz, and Charlie Parker came down. He was amazed by how beautifully Ken played. And Kenneth was just one of those people who lived for music his whole life and someone that I just admired so much, unfortunately was able to finally record the bassoon concerto before he passed away. And he was just an amazing person and a role model for me of someone who played music all of his life was generous, was inspiring, loved what he was doing, and had a wonderful work ethic and shared all his blessings with anyone who could say please and thank you, which is the only tuition necessary to advance musically. All the people who go to your nearby Interlochen know that. So for me, I was a student of Kenneth Vazmatic. And um, he was always Mr. Pasmatic to me because this was in junior high school and high school. And so occasionally uh, David's name would come up and they would, he would chat about the jazz and that kind of thing. Um, so when I talked to David the other day, when we had a conversation, we had this uh, kind of this love feast about Kenneth Pasmatic. I, I will say Mr. Pasmatic at one point said to me, if I ever hear you become a professional musician, I'm going to come and break your leg. <laughs> and he, he said that for like three reasons. One, he said, you're not good enough. You know, there are people that are, have more musical ability in their little finger than you do. And he says, I want you to love music. I don't want you to have to stress over it. And then the other thing he was talking about was that um, I was too smart to be a musician. I had too many interests. And uh, <laughs> You know, uh, people people in symphony orchestras kind of get stuck in a groove, and I think at the time he was he was ready to retire because he was tired of playing uh, the Messiah every year, <laughs> that kind of thing. So, and and finally, you know, it's a tough life to be a professional musician. Um, they're very small. They're very few jobs, and uh, you know, I, I I I appreciate him doing that. And when he did cause me to do is I still play today. We have a woodwind quintet going up here. 
and um, he's he's he was my mentor in that. So um, rather than that, I, I still love music. I'm an amateur musician, and uh, I think if I beat my head against the wall trying to be a professional, um, I, w I would have been turned off to the whole the whole idea. Anyway, so that was our our connection. We had a this very good friend who was a, a, a bassoon player. And um, one one thing about. Ken, that was amazing. He way back in before 1952, before Charlie Parker came down and gave Ken his compliments, he was playing jazz and appreciated jazz as a language that shared with the language of the various forms of classical music a special place and representing special cultures and special music that could become part of your vocabulary as a musician. Your own great Nancy Stagnetta, magnificent flute player, played my uh, concerto called Giants of the Night with your symphony orchestra and, and it's on YouTube with an orchestra in China. And she's someone who can play jazz and play Mozart and do them both magnificently. Ken was doing that 60 some years ago when no one was. Now, Wynton Marsalis and a ton of other people are doing that. And it's a wonderful thing for the young players to see that it, you can speak more than one language and you can learn more than one language in music. And once you do that, then you go back to the classics and you realize that Baroque composers from Italy are played differently than the music of Duke Ellington or Monk when it's done with the symphony or Bartok or Schoenberg or whoever, and that each each kind of music has its own language, its own style. And jazz opens up your mind and your heart to that and also reminds us of Kammer music, chamber music, and the idea that small is beautiful and playing in a small place is exactly what happened with Chopin, was the killer house pianist and, aristocrats homes in Europe and when the great string quartets of Mozart, Beethoven, Brahms were performed in people's homes. So we're getting back to that and sometimes an economic decline reminds us of what it's all about and we shouldn't have to have an economic decline to appreciate beauty, individuality and Ken was one of those people who always accentuated that whether he was playing in a jazz club or playing a solo with the symphony he always gave it his very best and always did his very best and always respected and learned the languages of music. Just one last thing about Ken, and I, I, I would say this to David too about David, is that he was a servant to the music. Right. Uh, the idea was to get the music out. It wasn't his ego. He never showed off. He, he just played it as well as he could. And I get that same feeling with you, David, that you are you also a servant to the music. <laughs> well, we try. We try to be. We try. That's a lifetime struggle every day. And they say that we're all born with a wolf and a dog inside of us. And you, all of us, have the choice whether we want to feed the wolf or the dog. Mm. And that's something that we can think about every day. And I think the Manchurian Candidate was an example of everyone working on that deciding they wanted to do a good job for a wonderful story in the best way that they could. So no one was upstaging anybody. No one was getting in the way. And it worked as a whole program. And sometimes doing, doing whether you're playing at a symphony, a jazz group, or being part of a picnic, family picnic, everybody has what they can do to make the whole more than the parts. And doing that is rewarding in a certain way that you cannot get by staring in the mirror or just being a narcissistic swinish egomaniac. That's an overcrowded field in the non-growth industry. <laughs> All right. All right. Wait, okay, wait back to have another question. What was the significance of Janet Lee's character, Eugenie Rose Cheney? Ted, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, she's kind of a, it's kind of weird. And in, in the book, um, she has a boyfriend that talks about this uh, fiance that she dumps. And in the book, that this fiance was a, a FBI agent. And so he gets involved in it, but they didn't include that in the movie. So she really comes out of nowhere. 
Um, she's beautiful and sympathetic. And, and so, uh, the, the significance for me is that she's the antithesis of, of, uh, of the Angela Lansbury character, you know, a warm, kind, open person. But where she comes from and, you know, why she was so immediately, you know, uh, open up, that's in the book, but it's it's also in the movie. It, it, she just is kind of a mystery, and, and, but it doesn't matter just because she's a strong character and she's Janet Lee. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else want to comment further on that? No, I, I mean, I, I think she's a wholly ambiguous character. Uh, that conversation that, that she has with uh, uh, Sinatra on the train talking about it's Maryland, it's Delaware, it could be Ohio. Um, I was one of the Chinese workers who put down the, the train tracks. It, it's nonsensical, but it's really more of what you see visually that's going on between them as opposed to the dialogue. And I think they're, I'm trying to remember, but I think there's a, a soft music bed underneath that that sort of has that feeling of don't pay attention to the words. This is a dance. This is a the beginning of something. But mm. then she also makes a comment later referring to uh, one of the people in Sinatra's dream as the general. So there's sort of this odd, is she kind of uh, his minder in a sense? Um, but it does go to, to, to uh, Ted's point too of the mirror images in the, uh, in the movie or extremes of, of things. So she's good and Angela Lansbury is evil as the only two women. Well, I also think, too, is along the line, you don't really know in the film if she is the handler or the operator that's right. supposed to might or handle uh, Sinatra's character because she seems to be looking at him and all that dissonance in the train when they're talking to each other were those key words that were triggering things in his memory to, to like, have her, have him like her or something. It just it just played to all that and because you, you wonder who are these people throughout the whole movie, you know, who are who are the the bad, the bad people. Well, I, I actually, I wanted to ask David a direct question again, sorry. And I think it's, it's sort of one of the questions one of our, our guests asked as well, but you had mentioned Splendor in the gla uh, in the grass uh, a, a little while ago. And, and I, looking back at your, you know, the filmography noticed that you did two films for Kazan and two films for Frankenheimer. And essentially they're very different directors. They both had obviously very, uh, keen interest in in uh, social problems and, and social elements, but they were different directors um, technically and um, in what they how they made films. How was Kazan with your building of scores for him? Was it similar to Frankenheimer or was it drastically different? Well, he had a different thing. He always got a great cinematographer, and he said, "You know, my gift is in trying to get the actors." to do something that they've never done before. Sometimes I make the character change so that they can become part of that actor and that the actor has certain limitations or problems or memories. I try to use those so that the difference between the person that we see on the stage, which I've worked with him with, or on film, becomes a reality. And that's a long-winded way of saying, keeping it for real. And he had that amazing gift, have everyone give the very best performance that he could. And he was smart enough to know that if he got a fantastic cinematographer, yeah. he could make it apply to being a good film. And on the other hand, Frankenheimer said to me, 95% is the casting I know how to do the shots. And I worked with him on television. He was like a genius at that. And he said, here's the pro. And he would go through and snap his fingers and so, tell me the 75 shots. And he could see that before he made the shot. He was incredible. But he said, you know, as far as the acting, I just show them where to be, give them a general thing and let them go. And Kazan told Jack uh, Garfine, a great director before he died, when he was, Jack Garfine told me he was in an elevator, Kazan said, you know, our job as directors is to be a guide. And uh, 
Kazan himself was such a fantastically good actor. When you see those old movies where he's playing those little character parts, he was able to speak the language of actors and get them to be able to be themselves and make the person that they were playing be them. And it was always, everyone always said they gave their best performances. So when he was doing the music suggestions, the theme that I did for Splendor in the Grass, which is really, you know, I spent a week orchestrating it, but originally that was a tune that I threw in. It was supposed to be a high school band playing something sentimental. He said, that's the one we have to use. I said, you're kidding. He said, no, no. He said, you can orchestrate that. You can make that into a classical piece and it will say what it should be for the whole film. So I took his suggestion because I really trusted and admired everything that he did. And as Frankenheimer never said anything except just to do it. And I was able to take his suggestion and do something I never would have done except to have it be played as like a high school band playing something and use that as, as a theme. In other words, he could hear what was there in a larger framework than I could imagine. And I just say that not to be modest, but just he had that gift, not only for music, but for acting for everything. I, I don't know if that's a good answer. He was oh, great. At no, it's brilliant. That's yeah. great. All right, sure. Uh, White Fang, do we have another question here? The headline on the newspaper in Sinatra, Sinatra's hands reads, Midwest wiped out by hurricane, 20 dead. <laughs> Director's dark and funny sense of humor. Kevin? Oh, 100%. I mean, it, at, at its core, and, and David mentioned this right at the top, um, this is, and, and Ted did too, this is satire. And there is satire woven through this at both both the comic level and then a very serious level. Um, and I think that's a perfect example of just watching people. If you're paying attention, you're going to catch stuff like that in a satire. And it, it was, yeah, it's brilliant. I noticed that the first, the, the second time I saw it, uh, recently just this week and yeah that's a cute little hurricane that wipes off the map but you know who knows with the, he could have just been forecasting global warming you know 20 years from now there could be hurricanes that will wipe out 20 in the midwest who knows so it, it could have been it could have been an actual we had a lot of tornadoes back then in the midwest and it could have just been an actual report what ted yes. okay no this is a hurricane not tornado yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm um, with so Jumping off the, you know, jumping in the lake, and it's just such a, a witty thing, and it's just a, you know, I don't, I don't think if you're paying attention, you really see it, but um, it, it, it's just this really a very witty scene, and and your music underneath it is so creepy. That's, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, just the whole idea that uh, somehow um, the the right phrase was used over in the you know in a bar and uh, he he has to go and follow the demand you know so it was very witty and a kind of slapstick but at the same time it really fed into um, what what he was going through being I'm not being able to control himself. Mm -hmm. All right, White Fang, we have another question there. David, did you get any pushback or call for emphasis with your scores from Frankenheimer or others from production? Uh, did you say pushback? No, the only thing I got was when uh, I was working with Frankenheimer on The Young Savages, the, the producer, whom I called Mr. Integrity in my book, because all the articles were what a great humanitarian he was, I was screaming, say that we don't want somebody who's a nobody, nothing to be doing a film. And, and, and Frankenheimer got so angry that he turned... He, turned almost purple and his veins were sticking out screaming finally he said i'm too rich and too psychoanalyzed to have to argue with you i want this kid to do it and begrudgingly i was allowed to do it and when i was told to by the producer not by frankenheimer but by the producer that i had to put this lovely romantic music that i'd written for something else underneath an atrocious scene of two teenagers who fall, were falling in love and were supposed to represent street gangs in New York. I said, you know, that's such a mawkish scene. If you add anything sentimental, it'll make it worse. And he said to me, if you don't use it, I'll play what you wrote backwards. So I went all the way out, recorded it again at their expense, 
had a rental car that was stolen from the parking lot, which was a good sign, and they ended up not using it. And then when I was told, it don't sound like movie music, I was prepared for that. And when I met Jack Warner, uh, he said, uh, he was sort of like a Catskill comic with a phalanx of guys in gabardine suits that would go, uh, 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 every time he told a joke. And he said to Kazan, uh, uh, guy, hey, man, he's not need nobody. He never did nothing. He said, you had a letter Bernstein. He never did nothing in Hollywood. He was nothing, but he did all right with, the, with that uh, on the waterfront. So I guess this kid might be all right, but he never did nothing. Then he turned to me and he said, who's greater than Leonard Bernstein? And being a smart guy of 29, I said, Beethoven. And I thought it was, the guys were going to smash my head and but they all went, uh, 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 because he laughed first. And I remembered that. And I said, well, I admire anybody who can work with these people and achieve anything. And of course, there were people who weren't that way. And those are the ones who made some wonderful films. And some of the old timers in the 30s did make some marvelous movies. But I just felt, you know, that if I had stayed there, even though I was offered seven films after the Manchurian Candidate, when I said I couldn't possibly write that much good music in a year and do a good job, which was a sickening thing for them to hear. The idea a good job was like the worst thing you could possibly say, apparently. I saw somehow, if I were lucky, five years down the line, I would be the ghostwriter for the next David Amram when they got sick of me. So I just pursued what I love to do. I just worked with Barbara Koppel about two years ago. She's a great filmmaker. And I had the same wonderful experience of doing the best I possibly could. And I think film scoring is an art and all the young composers now who could do that can use their training and the young filmmakers can take an iPhone and make a whole film themselves. It's all changing and it's changing for the better. And that will make in turn Hollywood go back to what it has been. And there are a lot of great films being made. And a lot of the reason is because younger people are bringing their creativity and standards to what we're seeing and hearing. And the old system is factory system is now being replaced with something more artistic and being artistic means doing a good job. Good. Thank you, David. That's a really good point. Uh, where the industry was having troubles and problems and needed a change. And just the crisis has, it's just only accelerated it. And I think you're right on the spot about the independence and the smaller films and uh, something we need as a group ourselves, the theater to consider. So thank you, David. Uh, Ted, did you have something to say? No, I was just saying, I, I hope that works out. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is. Your, your theater is an example of that. I hope so. Rather than going out of business or saying, okay, we're going to have to take the worst piece of crud that we wouldn't want to have our dog have to see. And that's the only thing you can see because you're told that's what they want. <laughs> Rather than that, the collapse of the dinosaurs disappeared because they no longer could function in their situation. But the planet didn't disappear. People don't disappear. We all are startling the same as we were 3,000 years ago when Aristophanes wrote those wonderful comedies. Mm -hmm. And what Shakespeare wrote is still true. And the human condition is terrifyingly, remarkably the same. And the need for good films and good stories of any kind will always be here. And now, as the old says, so long has been good to know you, it's being replaced with a bunch of gifted people who maybe out of desperation, instead of figuring they can become trillionaires, are gonna say, I wanna do something good while I'm alive. And there's gonna be more good stuff being done. And with the internet, it's possible to have some kind of option for composers, for conductors, for musicians, for symphony players, for jazz players, for folk musicians, and for actors, screenwriters, directors, set designers, people who can film stuff, to all have a chance to exercise their skills and do a good job. Very good, thank you, David. It's get time, close to time. Uh, White Fang, I have one question we can answer or anything. Do you have another one for us? 
Major Marco mentions, oh, this is good, Orestes and <laughs> Clementstra, Clementstra, Greek characters in Greek tragedies. How is this a hint to the final action in the film? Ted, let's go with you on that. I wrote this one up. It's in the book, and, and for some, you know, in, in the movie, um, Major Marco, the Sanctionata character, is this, this, this guy reads all kinds of books. And so at some point, he just drops the line about Orestes and Clytemnestra. And in the Greek tragedy, I, I got the, I have to note here, Orestes was the son of Agamemnon. He's the guy that did the war to the, um, the Trojan War. And um, Agamemnon was killed by um, Clytemnestra's lover. The, Clytemnestra was the wife and the mother of Orestes, the, 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 the wife of Agamemnon and the um, mother of, Clyde, of, of uh, Orestes. And in the drama, um, Orestes kills his mother and her lover. So there's this uh, little drop in the little, I don't know, little something in the movie that kind of foreshadows what's going to happen in the end if you had a classical training that, um, you know, here's Raymond Shaw. And I've always liked that name, Raymond Shaw, that somehow it comes out really well. But Raymond Shaw does end up killing uh, his mother and her lo and her lover, and uh, in the book he he accuses um, um, his mother of, of causing his father to commit suicide. So here's a, here's a Greek tragedy, American tragedy. You know, the kind of there's a rhyme in there. So that's that's what that's about. Okay. I I, uh, I have one real quick question because I know we're running out of time, but I I would be remiss if uh, I did not ask David if he could um, give us an explanation of what it means to be an ethnofunkologist. Oh, well, that was the term when people, because I, when I went around the world, I loved Albert Schweitzer bringing Bach to Africa, but I thought, boy, if only he brought some of Africa back to Europe and the United States and other places. So every place I went, I tried to learn a little something about where I was. And the word Funk means the essence, the undefinable spirit and feeling that relates to a certain culture. And if you're not born into it, you better learn to respect it. So when they said, here's an ethnologist, I said, no, I'm an ethnofunkologist. I try to see the spirit and the essence and the beauty and the history of every single place I go every kind of music I hear and then learn that from scratch, just as you taught me how to get online, like a nursery school student, so I can share that with other people. And David, that's a, that's a beautiful way to end this session. We want to thank you very much for coming to you and thank you, Marlis Mann, for connecting us with David. We thank you, Marlis, thank you. And it's just been a very wonderful time here. This is our first time back after a couple of months. Uh, we will be here in two weeks uh, and just want to make sure that everybody understands is that we have at the theater this weekend, uh, American president, uh, it's, uh, it's on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And then the next film after that is going to be Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Mm -hmm. And we will be doing that as a live stream Q and a two weeks from today at 7 30 PM. So we want to say thank you very much to everybody who's been participating with us today. David, you've been wonderful. Uh, we appreciate it. Yes, a great round of applause for David. We appreciate that. And we just want to say goodbye and wish you well, and we'll see you at the theater.
see everybody at the movies. Thank you for being here tonight. David, it was an awesome experience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Keep up your